All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first in what we hope will be, and what we, we know will be, a long series to invest and inspire our community here in Decatur. And I'm Mike Halvey, the Chief Operating Officer of Newhoff Media. It is my honor and privilege to spend uh, this time with you today. Uh, we are thrilled to have with us a, a mentor of mine and a, a teacher of mine who you will meet here in just a few minutes. As you can see in your screen, if you zero in on John Bates, he's a little spacey, but there's a good reason why. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, we wanna first remind everybody, if you wanna join the conversation today, at least physically, you can turn your cameras on and be a part of, uh, of what we do today. Uh, Lindsay Romano is actually spinning the dials behind the scene, much as she did for years for Brian's show. So uh, she'll get mics turned on and off as, as they are required. So, so that on the technical side, that's all uh, going to be locked down and, and ready to go. Uh, we are thrilled that we are together in Zoom, but we're also a little sad that we're not at the conference center with uh, 600 of our friends like we have been for uh, our big uh, quarterly or I guess now semi-annually events uh, with the community leaders breakfast or in, in, in the PAC Decatur Center or the, the Decatur Club, but that will happen soon enough. But it's great to see so many community leaders on the screen at any one time today. So before we get started with our presenter, John Bates, uh, it's my distinct privilege to honor and, uh, and welcome our partner uh, in Invest and Inspire, and that's Carla Miller. Carla? Hi, I'm Carla Miller, and on behalf of Hickory Point Bank, we are pleased and excited to bring you the Invest and Inspire Leadership Series, along with Newhoff Media. To all of our friends and neighbors in the community, we hope you come away from today's event filled with a positive energy and a path for personal success. So enjoy. All right, Carla, thank you. I have a question for everyone on the call today. What was your favorite Christmas present? Now think back, you could be a kid or you can be an adult, but think back to your favorite Christmas present. For me, up until about seven years ago, it was an electric football game. I remember the excitement of Christmas morning running downstairs and there it was, it was an electric football game. Well, that was until Beth Newhoff gave me a Christmas present seven years ago. That Christmas present you are about to meet because that Christmas present was John Bates. John Bates has been a mentor to me. He has been a coach to me. Uh, he has helped our company's communication skills. He's helped my communication skills. In a Christmas present that was only supposed to last three months, it has now gone on for seven years. And today you're gonna find out why. So with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, my mentor, and for the next 55 minutes, someone who's gonna share knowledge with all of us, Mr. John Bates. I'm gonna make a shirt that says, wait, you're on mute. Thank you, Michael. I'm gonna just start by showing you my Superman outfit that's underneath my business shirt. Here we go. And I think uh, over the next 55 minutes, I will be explaining why I would do this. So here we go. Yes, it says 98.7% bonobo. And I'm trying to live up to that. And I'll explain to you what I mean. I'm going to start by pointing something out to you that I think is really important for our times in particular. And that is that we all have whites in our eyes. Now, let me come back with me a number of years. I'm at an event called the EG event. And boy, it's really exciting because this is the same group of people that originally started the TED conference. And so I'm there, I'm getting to meet amazing people. And I'm talking to one of the speakers named Brian Hare, who has a, a company at the time called Dog Nition. He, taught, he, he is studying how dogs really understand humans so well. Uh, turns out, you know, 50,000 years of coevolution will do that. But 
He said a few things that remind me of a theory that I just read about. So I said, Brian, you know, I just read about, <coughs> excuse me, the most amazing theory. Did you know, did you know that we are one of the only animals in the world with whites in our eyes? And we're the only primate with whites in our eyes at all. The only one. And it's not even something that varies. Like all of us have whites in our eyes. It's not like some of us do and some of us sort of do. We all have whites in our eyes. And it turns out that if you sit a dog down across from you and you put its favorite food under one bucket and nothing under another bucket and you look at that bucket, the dog will get it, right? Dog will go to that bucket every time. There's no question, it, it understands you. But if you sit one of the most brilliant, smart, big-brained primates down, a chimpanzee or a, or, an, or a great ape or any of that stuff, a gorilla, whatever, and you do that, it won't get it. Still 50-50 whether it gets what's under the bucket or not. And it turns out that we gave up whites in our eyes at a great cost, right? Because when you've got whites in your eyes, now you're not on video. You could come on video if you want. I'd love to see you, but I'm on video. So now look, can you tell where I'm looking? You can tell where I'm looking, right? Even from kind of far away, you can tell where I'm looking. And that means that we gave up being sneaky. Because if you could, if we didn't have whites in our eyes, it would be much harder to tell where we were looking. You wouldn't know as well what we were thinking. We wouldn't give ourselves away so often. But we traded the ability to be sneaky. Thank you for coming on camera. Great to see you. Love to see you if you want to come on camera. I'm having a bad hair day, so it doesn't get worse than this. Um, so whites in our eyes. It turns out we gave up having dark eyes and being able to be sneaky much better in order to have these whites in our eyes so that we could better see what each other were thinking and better cooperate. That's why we have whites in our eyes and no other primates do, almost no other animals do. And so it turns out that cooperation is one of the absolute fundamental evolutionarily, you know, evolutionary biology traits that differentiated human beings. It's why we're so successful. And he said, yeah, John, that's my theory. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. So it was one of the most genuine fanboy moments I've ever had. Like here I am telling him his own theory with great excitement and I didn't even know it was his theory. But he said, yeah, that's my theory. And I said, okay, Brian, oh, that's amazing. So here's what I say when I finish saying that in my courses and in my trainings, I say, so I say that that is proof that authenticity is an evolutionary advantage for human beings. And he said, well, yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. You could say that. So I'm saying it. I genuinely believe that authenticity is a fundamental evolutionary advantage for human beings. We gave up being sneaky so that we could better be authentic with each other, see what each other were, were, were thinking, read each other better so that we could better cooperate. Now, years later, last year, this book came out. It's called Survival of the Friendliest, and it's written by none other than Brian Hare. And why that's important is because what I want to share with you today and what I want to talk about today, I want to give you some absolute key principles when it comes to communicating with human beings that will make you vastly more effective when you apply them. And I want to ask each of you to promise to only use those skills for the light side of the force. And I want to share with you what I think is 
the most important piece of our success as a species so that you will be even more motivated to use everything you know for the light side of the force. Now, does that sound fair for those of you that are on video? Is that we're sticking around for? This will definitely be, if you apply these things, it will make a massive difference, I can promise you. So let's roll with that then. Okay, so, you know, the reason I have this shirt on is because bonobos are almost exactly like chimpanzees, but the big difference is bonobos will radically cooperate. They will do anything in their power to not fight things out. They work things out. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, they'll just fight. Now, why that's important is, and why I'm so proud to be 98.7% bonobo and trying to live up to that is because in this book, Survival of the Friendliest, Brian Hare and his uh, partner, Vanessa Woods, outline a really compelling theory for what happened in the, uh, in the, um, the upper Paleolithic. So back in the day, a long time ago, we've now discovered that there were multiple types of humans on earth at the same time. There were homo sapiens, like all of us, there were, uh, there were um, Neanderthals. And by the way, I, if you want to know a throwback, you know me. I have more Neanderthal DNA than 98% of people on 23andMe. I don't think I should necessarily brag about that. And the funny thing is my brother, my blood brother from the, both of the same parents, he only has more Neanderthal than 31% of, of people on 23andMe. So... I'm a Neanderthal. It's kind of maybe where I get the brow ridge, but um, there were Neanderthals. There were there were other species like Denisovans, and they were all we were all living on Earth at the same time in the Paleolithic, and then in the Upper Paleolithic, the later Paleolithic, something happened, and all of a sudden, all of those other species of humans either got wiped out or just incorporated into Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens took over the entire planet. What happened? Here's what happened. We developed whites in our eyes and we got more friendly. Brian and Vanessa and a lot of their colleagues think that one of the most destructive things for human thinking is when Darwin came out with evolutionary theory, people started talking about survival of the fittest. And what everybody envisions is the biggest, strongest, most dominant, mean. That's not at all what fitness looks like for human beings. What fitness looks like for human beings is whites in our eyes, the ability to be friendly across multiple tribal groups versus every group that encounters each other having to fight. One of the really big things that we see in the record is we started to be able to be friendly instead of fight with other tribes that we had decided we wanted to be affiliated with through trade or other things like that. That is fundamentally what set us apart from every other creature on earth is our ability to be friendly. So that friendliness, that cooperation, that collaborative nature that we have, that is our secret weapon. And I hope it's okay for me to just say this out loud, but I feel like in large parts of our daily conversation and our news conversation and our social media conversation, we have forgotten how much we need each other, whether we agree on every single thing or not. And that I think is an existential threat to both our country and our species. I'm gonna say that again, because I don't think it's an exaggeration in the least. I believe that forgetting that we need each other and that collaboration and being friendly and at least 
being able to interact with each other without massive conflict, that is utterly crucial to our survival, both as a nation and as a species. So keep in your mind, and if you want a great book recommendation, I don't get paid for this, <laughs> you know, this survival of the friendliest is one of the best reads that I, I have read in a long time. And I highly recommend it. And so with that background of friendliness being our single most important tool, differentiator, survival skill, I want to step into sharing with you some of the things that I get to share with the, with clients like Mike. And, you know, uh, just because it was a bucket list and I'll, and I, it just, I can't even I can hardly believe that I get to say this, but I got to train all the U.S. astronauts. And in fact, just got a call from space the other day from the guy who's the, the commander of the International Space Station. And, um, and please keep it in just this group. But he told me that he and Victor Glover, who's up there as well, were talking about working with me and they were sharing each other's you know stories with each other and really thinking about how to craft them and reminding themselves again of how important stories are for human beings and interacting with human beings. So um, these are things that I've, that I've shared with people at Navy uh, Special Operations, at NASA, with the astronauts, with Johnson & Johnson, with Boston Scientific, with, with Mike uh, Holby and his team at Neuhoff Media all over the world. And I want to share with you just a couple of the most key things. And I know from the last more than 10 years of doing this, that if you take these on, they will dramatically amplify your effectiveness. They will probably make life more fulfilling. Not that anything changes much, but you bring these things and they'll also make it a lot more fun. So let me Start by saying the thing that I think is one of the most important things that I ever share with anyone, and then we're going to unpack it. I say communicating with human beings is not logical. Did you notice? <laughs> communicating with human beings is not logical. It is biological. And when you understand the biology, you can make it logical again. But if you go into a situation thinking that logic by itself should win, you'll just never be as effective as you could be if you got that there was something else that's necessary too. So let me share with you the neurobiology that underlies that. If you look at a human brain at a cross section of a human brain, any normal human brain, like you, me, Mike, Brian, Carla, Michelle, Beth, okay? If you looked at that brain, you would see that there's the brain stem that goes into the spinal column. And then wrapped around the brain stem is the midbrain. And together, these two pieces form what's called the paleomammalian brain or the limbic system, or the emotional brain. Those three things are all the same, three names for the same piece. And I like paleomammalian brain because it gets the point across that this is old. It's been around for a long time. All mammals have it. My service dog, Flash, who just passed a little while ago, he had a paleomammalian brain. The horse that you like to ride, the dogs, the cats, all, all mammals have a paleomammalian brain. And it is uh, the part of our brain that's been tasked with keeping us alive. And then wrapped around that brain is the neocortex, the cerebral cortex. Now, neo means new. Like, it's similar to Neuhof, new house, right? Um, so, or, or new, new farm, I guess, is a hoof. But neo means new. So it's the new brain wrapped around the outside of the old brain. Now, I'm going to say something kind of weird. I'll say it twice. So if you don't get it the first time, that's okay. I'll say it twice. This ancient brain, the paleomammalian brain, does not have access to language or logic or reason. 
it's tasked with keeping us alive, but it does not have language or it doesn't have reason. It doesn't have language. It doesn't have logic, but it's tasked with keeping us alive. The cerebral cortex, the neocortex is where language and logic and reason lie. Okay, so the ancient brain doesn't have access to language or logic or reason, but it does have access to reality on a fundamentally deeper level than we will ever have access consciously. I'll say that again. <laughs> the ancient brain does not have access to language or logic or reason, but it does have access to reality on a fundamentally deeper level than we will ever have access consciously. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. This ancient part of the brain, the paleomammalian brain, is what sees facial micro expressions. And it sees all that unconscious body language and movement that we're sending back and forth all the time, completely unconsciously, but it's there and it has an enormous, makes an enormous difference. It also smells pheromones. So we know we're, all, we're consciously, constantly sending messages back and forth to each other through pheromones. This is the part of the brain that perceives that, but it can't just tell us about that because it doesn't have language. So the way it communicates with us is through gut feelings. You've had those before, right? Oh, I just, I don't know. I just, it feels right to me or doesn't feel good or like, oh no, that's not, I don't know why, but it just doesn't feel right. Oh yes, it does feel, it feels great. Yes, I don't know what it is, but I just got a good feeling. That is your ancient paleomammalian brain telling you about what it's actually perceiving. It notices patterns in things long before we ever would notice consciously, smells pheromones, sees facial microexpressions. If you get a good feeling about that person, that's probably a good signal. That's probably a good thing to listen to, right? Your mom probably told you, trust your gut. And if she didn't, I'm telling you now, trust your gut. That's good information. It just comes to you through gut feelings because your ancient brain can't talk to you. It doesn't have language. But we all think that we're logical, right? Come on, don't we? Most of us, come on. I'll make the logical choice, John. You know, that may be true, but I'm going to weigh things out. I'll check the boxes. I'm a logical person at the end of the day. You may do all that, but when it comes to actually making the decision in the moment, if we watched your brain in real time, as you made that decision, what we would see is boom, your ancient brain fires first making the decision. And then right after that, nanoseconds after that, but after that, maybe it's even a little more than nanoseconds, your conscious logical brain either agrees with or disagrees with the decision, but it's not the part that makes the decision. That's the ancient paleomammalian non-logical part of your brain. Now, what does this look like on the ground out there in the world, doing business, talking to your family, all that stuff. Here's what it looks like. Generalize this for yourself, but tell me if you've never had an experience like this, and I'll probably not believe you, but let's just see. Have you ever had the experience? Do you like the product? Oh yeah, we like the product. You think it's priced, right? Oh yeah, good price, uh-huh. Do you think it'd make a difference for you to have it? Oh, why certainly, yes. Well, do you wanna sign the check and we'll start delivery? <sighs> no, we're, we're not ready yet we want to think about it a little longer. Okay. Anybody ever not had that experience? Yeah. Everybody's had that experience, right? Okay. Now when there's a lot of money on the line or when it's, you know, your whole team at a big organization and they're like, yes, yes, yes. No, people get really upset about that. People, they're like, were they lying to me? What's going on? Right? Yes, yes, yes. No. What's that about? Okay, in hindsight, it's very obvious and it's very simple, but that's hindsight, right? So here we go, watch what happened. Yes, 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 no. Logic, 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 emotion. Logically, they were all in. Yes, we like it. Yes, it's priced right. Yes, it'd make a difference. No, we're not ready yet. We didn't make the emotional connection with them yet. We didn't put that ancient paleomammalian brain at ease enough that it could relax and let logic drive. So 
Here's one of the most fundamental truths I could tell you when it comes to dealing with human beings. Until you have an emotional connection, all the logic in the world just bounces off. Now look at why that's true. The ancient brain sits right there on top of the spinal column. And to get to the spinal column, to send a signal out to any part of the body to take action, like sign a check, the, the new brain, the cerebral cortex, the neocortex must go through the ancient brain. So guess what? If we don't put them at ease, if we don't make that connection with them, if we don't have them feel like they're somehow in the same tribe with us and we care about similar things and have a connection, that's what we're always going to get. Yes, 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 no. That yes, 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 yes comes from also having the emotional connection. Now, it's on you, right, to get the first three yeses. Logically, your business plan has to make sense. Logically, your, your, the thing that you're selling needs to help the person that you're trying to sell it to. But I figure you're, all, you're here, you know, so that's handled. This is not the place where I think any of you get stuck. This is the place where I see all kinds of people who are competent, amazing people with wonderful things to offer get stuck. And it's because we didn't make that emotional connection. So one of the key ways to do that, because look, we could go on, you want to come do a week long class with me and look at all the ways you could do that. But one of the key ways, one of the fastest, easiest ways that I think will stick with you is small talk has been misnamed. Small talk has been misnamed. Small talk is not small talk. Small talk is big talk. The reason we're confused about it is because it genuinely doesn't matter what we talk about. That's true. But what matters is how we talk about it and that we talk about something that connects us. Does that land? Does that make sense to people that are on video? Give me a nod. Yeah. So small talk has been misnamed. Small talk is not small talk. Unless you treat it like small talk, then it could make no difference. But if you treat it like it's big talk and you look for those ways to connect and put the other person at ease and talk about things that you have in common that matter to you both in a way that connects you, that's huge. Good? All right. So now, do you want the second big piece of neurobiology for communicating with human beings? Do you feel like, like, does, you know, to those of you on video, at least, does this make sense? Is there, is there something that you really don't get about this? Is you, are you like, wait, wait, John, what about, or does this make sense? Makes sense? Okay, good. So let's go on to the next big piece of neurobiology. And that is something called mirror neurons. Now, to, if anybody on here is a real science dork, yes, there's a little bit of, of, of argument still going on about what the actual physiology of this is, but there's zero argument about the outcome. So whatever's going on in there physiologically, we have mirror neurons and they are neurons in our bodies that have us feel what we see other people going through. They have us feel that. So if somebody walks in the room and they're happy, woo, we're all happy. Somebody walks in and they're sad. Oh, everybody's sad. What's wrong? Maybe, maybe they lost the lottery and I won, but I'm still sad for that moment because they're sad right? And if I were doing a cooking show for you instead, and I had big purple carrots and a big old butcher knife, and I was chopping up the purple carrots, and I'm telling you about the benefits of the answers. Okay, now, you're all so cute, the ones on video. Okay, I even jump, right? But I want you to notice, I didn't have purple carrots. And I don't have a big old butcher knife. But you jumped because you have mirror neurons. I jump when I see the video of myself. I can't help it. That's how powerful mirror neurons are. And they are always on. And here's the thing that I think we didn't get told enough. They are always mirroring you. 
they're always mirroring you. When you walk in the room and everybody turns to look at you, they're mirroring you. When you raise your hand and then you start to share in the meeting, they're all mirroring you. When you are at the top of the hierarchy, Mike Holvey, they're always mirroring you, which is why it's so important to have leaders like you and Beth, by the way. I can think of some companies I won't name who have the opposite and it, you know, a fish stinks from the head down. It also smells good from the head down. So people are always mirroring you, whether you realize it or not. And here's the thing. This is, in my opinion, scientific proof for the fact that you always get what you put out. Think about the people you know, no pointing here, okay? No, no naming and shaming. Think of the people that you know that are grumpy all the time, right? They walk in the room, everybody gets grumpy. They grump around for a while. Everybody grumps around for a while. The minute they leave, we're fine again. But they think everybody's grumpy all the time everywhere because that's what they bring. Does that make sense? So they're always mirroring you. Now, I'm going to tell you my experience as a speaker, but I want to ask you to please generalize it to your entire life because what happened for me when I took this on, particularly in the realm of being a public speaker, was that it affected every area of my life and it really felt like Jedi mind power. And I don't mean Jedi mind tricks. I mean genuine Jedi mind power. Like these are not the droids you're looking for. These are not the droids we're looking for. Move along. You know, like it was unbelievable the impact this had for my experience of my life and how malleable reality became. They're always mirroring you. So here's the thing, give them something good to mirror. Once I took that on, I never had a bad audience again. We've all had bad audiences, right? Even Mike Holvey, unlikely as it would be, I'm sure he's at least had one bad audience in his lifetime. He doesn't have them anymore either. I never have bad audiences because the minute it even looks like it's turning into a bad audience, I don't blame them anymore. I look over here and think, what can I do to give them something even better to mirror? I never, ever let them pull me down. I am constantly standing on higher ground, pulling them up if I need to. Looking at the people that are lit up, taking that energy from them gratefully and getting it on the people that aren't quite lit up, you know? And if you take this on in your life that they are always mirroring you and you just need to give them something good to mirror, it's like Jedi mind powers. It's staggering. And it is a fundamental function of what it means to be human. We have mirror neurons. We cannot help but mirror each other. The thing that you can do though is very consciously maintain the high ground and have people bring people up with what you're giving them to mirror. Now, does that make sense? One of the best speaker things I could ever give you. Also one of the best leadership things, right? And, and in, in the leadership realm, and by the way, you're all leaders. I don't care where you are in the hierarchy. You are leaders in your lives, in your families, for yourself, in your community, this is just one of the key things. If you take on that they're always mirroring you, now, not like it's your fault, not that, not that, but if your team is not getting great results, you could start asking how you could give them something better to mirror. What is it I'm doing over here that has them getting those bad results, right? And how could I alter what I'm giving them to mirror so their results would improve? Not like it's my fault, but I could take responsibility for it. And that gives me access to impacting it, right? If you're not responsible for what they're doing, then how are you ever going to impact it, right? But if you take responsibility just out of generosity, not like you're at fault, but you are responsible and you look at it that way, it gives you a whole new set of things to access to actually impact their results. And I don't just mean at work, I mean in your community too, right? 
how could we all be responsible for giving other pe people better things to mirror, right? Not just in one-on-one -on -one conversation, but on social media, in the conversations we have in public, in the places where people are being not so nice to each other right now. How could we all take responsibility for giving other people in those realms that we inhabit something better to mirror? Yeah. So if there are any questions, you know, I, I've got some other things that I want to share with you. But uh, if there are other questions, um, I think that we've got a setup here. So there is Carla, are you helping me with this? Is that who or no? Um, so if you've got questions, someone will get them to me in the chat in the I guess the panelist chat is what it is. And I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so I'll give you a minute to think of questions. If you don't have questions, I suppose that's okay. Um, if you do have questions, please ask them. And Michael, you, you're you off mute. Were you going to say John, something? John, so I, was, I will just say, if you have a question, put it in the chat. And then if we have time at the end, John, we'll be happy to share those. And then if you don't say what I hope you're go going to say, there is something I want to specifically ask you, but go ahead. I don't want to interrupt your path. Okay. Well, so so let me just kind of recap. First of all, our secret weapon as human beings, the thing that has us be so successful is our ability to be friendly, to collaborate, and to cooperate. And without pointing fingers at either side, I genuinely believe that we are way off track in our country with that right now. And that is the collective behavior of hundreds of millions of each of us. So the only way that we can really impact that is by impacting who we're being and how we're showing up and taking on giving the people in the spaces we inhabit something good to mirror. And we need to make those emotional connections because all the logic in the world bounces off. You know, it's one of the big problems that I have with science communicators is they try so hard to be scientists and look good that they forget to talk to human beings and then stuff goes really awry. I do a ton of work with people at Johnson & Johnson and Boston Scientific, people in that science realm who are more interested in checking the box they heard it than just checking the box I said it, right? So I would offer that to all of you. <laughs> you know, by the way, my results changed completely because I used to be really interested in checking the box I told you so, right? I said it because then I could say, I told you so. Oh, I told you so. I told you so. Oh, I, you know, I didn't I tell you. But guess what? That didn't help my results at all. It just let me be right and make other people wrong, which is really actually not very helpful at all. But when I started to get interested in checking the box, they got it. I landed it over there. That's when my results started to really change for the better. And so, you know, how can we all bring that to the places that we inhabit? With the with the fundamental understanding that I think it is our our it's it's crucial to our survival, as a country and as as a species. So, if you can manage to bring more kindness and collaboration, you are doing the entire human race a favor. So, and I think it's incumbent on us because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And then the second piece is. Uh, you know, the paleo mammalian brain and the logical brain. Logic is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You've got to have a, a product that works, but that thing will not sell unless you also make an emotional connection with the person you want to buy your product, right? It has to do them, do good things for them and be worth it. And you have to make that emotional connection. And then third, we all have mirror neurons and they are always mirroring you. It puts you in the driver's seat of what's going on in your life. And it is one of the most powerful things that I personally ever took on in my whole life. It will blow your mind how many opportunities you will find 
if you keep yourself present to the fact that they're always mirroring you. So I see in the chat, um, Michelle Mitchell said, I'd love to know if there are specific examples of small talk that I could give. So, um, you know, uh, it's a really good question. And I'm, and I'm like, bunches of things are running through. And then of course, nothing really is sticking. But here's the thing, Michelle, like, you know, when you meet someone, like, for the first time, you've got uh, like, you know, people usually go, oh, you know, great to meet you. Where are you from? What is it you do, right? Um, as you go through those steps, if you're looking for places, cause you know, I used to look for where I could say something to. Now I switched that a little bit and I look for where can we connect, right? And it's less about them telling a story about being a surfer and then me telling a story about being a surfer. It's become much more about if they tell a story about being a surfer, I ask a couple questions. And then when they say something like meaningful or that touches me, I go, oh my gosh, that you're so right. You know, I surf too. And I've surfed a number of those places. And what you just said, oh, absolutely, right? And now look, it can't be a manipulation. I don't do that just to manipulate people. I, I look for what's truly deeply authentic and then I go for it with that right now if you're the one that's going first you could share something that might mean something to them that's a little vulnerable that can feel sort of scary but it's also a great invitation to a deeper conversation you know one of the things that I think about is this research I read that said it takes about x amount of time to really form a real friendship the only way that you can shortcut the amount of time it takes is if you focus on having really deep, meaningful, vulnerable conversations. That makes sense, right? Um, so I hope that that, that, that lands. Now, uh, here's another thing that I wanna offer you as we sort of start to wind, wind you know, bring this in to the close. If you're a computer programmer, you know the term API, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's a new different kind of a API and it's been around for a while because the internet's been around for a while, but it's never been needed more badly than it's needed now. So I would invite you, if you have some of these cool things, these little squares that stick on stuff, this is one of my favorite technologies write API on that and put it up by your computer. And here's what a API stands for. Assume positive intent. Assume positive intent. Now, the really easy question to answer is, wouldn't you always want people to do that for you? Right, if you're writing with a not positive intent, you usually make it pretty clear, right? But when you write something that could be interpreted multiple ways, wouldn't you always want everyone that you're communicating with to assume positive intent on your part? I would. And yet I know from very recently, I had an experience where, boy, it took me something to assume positive intent, you know, and I didn't even do it so well. Let me tell you the quick story. I write a, I write a newsletter. And my service dog Flash died on January 11th. And here at the beginning of April, I still had up a banner that said, remembering Flash. And pretty much, you know, I had stopped for a couple of emails, but then I brought Flash up again, right? So kind of public mourning going on for a while. And I'm still mourning Flash. Like I may never be over mourning Flash. And, I, and one of the people who gets my newsletter, who's uh, in Slovakia, wrote me back. He's like, oh, you just ruined Star Wars for me. And why do you always have to keep bringing up Flash? Like, I mean, when are you going to stop, right? Okay, so you could probably imagine that really hurt my feelings, <laughs> you know? And it actually kind of made me mad and sort of self-righteous. Like, can't you handle your own grief? Like, don't, you, maybe you've never had to grieve for anything and all, all this stuff, right? But I finally kind of calmed myself down 
sent him back an email that was not necessarily the best email I could have sent, but it, at least it gave, I asked him some questions that I just, you know, being a jerk like I wanted to be. And he wrote me back. Here's what he said. First of all, I can't believe you're reading this. I thought I would be sending this to your assistant. Second of all, you're right. I just lost the love of my life. She just left me and I thought she was the one, you know? So I've been really down and I look to your newsletters for uplifting positive messages. And when you combine Star Wars with losing or, or Star Trek with losing Flash, it just pushed me over the edge and I just got so sad. And that's why I wrote that. And I wrote him back and I said, thank you. You know, I don't think I fully understood the responsibility that I've taken on to the people who read my newsletter and you've given me a whole new way to see this. And I'm sorry if my previous email landed badly for you in any way. And I want you to know that you've given me an unbelievable gift and I will never forget this. Thank you for being willing to send me this second email too, right? Because I mean, I'd send him an unsubscribe list <laughs> as part of my, I'm like, look, if you want to unsubscribe, here it is, you know? I was so insecure and upset and whatever. But thank heavens that I at least did my best to assume positive intent. And, you know, the, the thing, another thing that really goes along with assuming positive intent is the willingness to pick up the phone and make a call if it starts to feel like things are getting off track. Don't send another email. Call them up and say, wow, I, you know, I must be misunderstanding that last email really hurt my feelings. So I just thought I'd call you because I, I can't imagine that's what you meant. How, how's everything over there? What's going on? You know, that pick up the phone and call before you assume something is, is going wrong is a huge thing. So, you know, the sticky note API and the willingness to make a phone call versus shooting off a heated email, that is another great, great, great place to come from. Now, I, I see a question. Um, I heard that you have a perspective on how the astronauts see the Earth when they return. Can you explain? Yes. This is something that, that you know, people are all over the map about their opinion about COVID and lockdowns and masks and stuff. I have my opinions too. Those are not what I'm going to bring here. What I will say is that I got a chance in late 2017 to train all of the active astronauts. And I, I made friends with a number of them. They're some of the nicest people on earth. Like that's one of the prerequisites. You don't get to become an astronaut unless you are genuinely likable. And boy, are they. Um, made good friends with a number of them and have had at length conversations with them. And something that comes up every time is this idea of what they call the overview effect. Because from what I understand, I, I, I would love to experience it myself, when you get out, when people get out into space and they're in orbit and they get a chance to look down and see the entire earth in all its color and beauty and high definition that's even better than your monitor, right? And they see the blackness of space and the absolute aloneness of this beautiful gem of a planet, it changes them. It just fundamentally forever changes them. And one of the things that they say is you can't see borders, right? You, you, all you see is this big planet and you get that whether we like it or not man our fates are entwined and this planet is precious and as nice as it would be to go to mars like there is nothing like this anywhere anywhere right that we're going to ever get to in a way that matters and it really gives them a new desire to solve the problems of earth you know, and 
this pandemic, I've been saying for quite a while, we are all in the same storm. I think that's undeniable. This is a global pandemic. It has been going on around the entire world almost at once, right? Like it's spread for all, but now now we're all in it. And we're not in the same boat. We're all in the same storm and we're not in the same boat. So I think that it is at once an opportunity for us to realize the overview effect that the astronauts talk about. We are all in the same boat. We, our fates are entwined, whether we like it or not, and whether we believe it or not, how it goes for, for this planet is how it goes for us. And that's it. Going to Mars is not going to save humanity, you know? And the thing that has also become really obvious through this pandemic is how much we are all in different boats and the disparity of those boats and the, the, you know, just the incredible gulf between the really nice boats and the not so nice boats, right? And how, how much there still is to do here on earth to have this be a place where our fates being entwined is, is going to work out, you know? So that is something that I would encourage you to go look for. There are videos you can find, the overview effect. You know, I also think it, it would be worth just going and doing a Google image search for, you know, high quality images of Earth and pretend that your office is the space station and your monitor is a window and let yourself feel that. It's pretty powerful. Like you don't have to go there to really get this feeling. And it's, profound. So um, I'm just going to say, um, you know, by the way, thank you. you find me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash John Bates. On May 17th, I'm going to be redoing my course, Powerful Virtual Leader for free in my Facebook group. You can find out more about that. You could, you know, reach out to me directly. If you subscribe to that weekly mini training, We'll be putting information in there, but it's five days in a row, 50 minutes a day. And it's all about showing up really well as a virtual leader from everything from Zoom to how to keep people engaged. Um, and then Dylan, you said going by mirror neuron theory, what is a good way to blow steam or vent so that when you're in the public eye, you're smiling on the outside, giving good energy, but dealing with the personal things on the inside. So look, that's a really great question. And I think one of the issues I have with a lot of the big name coaches is that they're like, you know, it feels like they want me to ignore my emotions. Oh, state change, you know? Uh, but if you're genuinely upset about something, I think it's very important to process it. And I believe that emotions are a great navigator. I try not to give them the driver's seat, right? But if I ignore them as a navigator, I end up in big trouble. And science, neuroscience is way behind that not enough time right now, but so your emotions are a great navigator and you need to give them their due, I think. And, you know, one of the things that I will do more than a lot of people that I know is if I come on a call like this and I'm in a bad mood when I show up, I'll say, you know what? I'm so glad to be here because I just had a horrible thing happen and I was very frustrated, but now I'm here. And I know the difference you make and I'm here to make a difference for you. So here we go, right? So I will actually unpack it right there in the moment if I'm worried that people are going to be seeing things in my micro expressions. Now, um, the other thing that I will do is just like, let's say that you're upset, you got to blow some steam and you know you're going into the public pretty soon. I'll sit in a room by myself and just say all the things that the chatter in my head is saying, like, oh, I'm pissed. They're stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. They think that I'm just going to roll over and take this or, you know, I mean, like whatever. And then I'll say, okay, and that stuff will be here when I'm done. I'm going to leave that right here. Come back to it at once this is done. And now these people deserve my best. I care about them. I know I can make a difference. I'm going to leave that stuff. It'll be there when I'm done. Here I come. Yeah. 
So that's sometimes easier than others, but I think it is really powerful because you can leave stuff at the door and you really can, you know, and then it'll be there when you're done. You know, it's not like it's going to go away. So I hope that that, I hope that that is at least uh, something, Dylan, that can, can make a difference. Because I think if you just shove it down, that's not authentic. You know, you do have to do something to deal with it. So Mike, I know that we're about three minutes. I might have stolen two minutes of yours. Um, no, John, you were terrific. And uh, on behalf of all of us who are here, and again, John had mentioned to you about sharing you with a video call. And I know that will come up in his, in, in his session uh, that he's talking about this coming summer. But with the Newhoff team, he, he told us the importance of actually being present. So turning your camera on, so that you join everybody else is really super important. And, you know, unless it's like really pressing in our company, all cameras are always on so that you're a part of us. We're all connected. I love it. So thank you for That's those. Fabulous. You, I've been looking at Peggy. Peggy, it's good to see you. I've been looking at Peggy this afternoon on the call. So it's great to see Peggy along with lots of other folks. And again, we want to thank the Hickory Point Bank. This, is, this series is, is called Invest and Inspire for a Purpose. And we hope that you have uh, invested and felt like you've invested the last 55 minutes in something that has inspired you to help others and make a big difference. And there's handsome John on the stage, you know, with his uh, Garth Brooks microphone. And again, <laughs> sincerely appreciate that. A couple of things for our folks, John, and I'll give you final word, I promise. Okay, great. Okay, great, great, great. And that Thank is, you. first of all, 20 of you are going to win a copy of John's book. Now I've got the original, I had to pay for it. Uh, so he may have been a Christmas present from Beth Newhoff, but I had to pay for the book. So I have a copy of the book here, which is great. This is on his speaking book, uh, The Amazing Itty Bitty Guide to Being Ted Worthy. And again, full disclosure, one of my goals in life is to give a TED talk. And uh, I'm gonna talk about dyslexia, I'm gonna talk about leadership, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about inspiring and making a difference in people. But that's John's helping me do that. So that was my little Christmas present from John. So we want to make sure that you have an opportunity, or at least 20 of you will have an opportunity to receive the same book. So uh, we have a Kindle version. 20 of those are going to be awarded to individuals who are on the call today. You are being selected at random. You will receive an email and uh, from this, uh, this web address. So don't delete because you're deleting a free book. Uh, you want to accept it. And then also and it's the, very short, <laughs> It is, but it's impactful. Look, you know, it, it's not very thick, but it's impactful. And then uh, this session has been recorded. You can tell on the upper left-hand part of your screen, it will be available on nowdecator.com. So you will be able to uh, impact that as well. So that's the, uh, the housekeeping part of it. You've, you've invested an hour on behalf of the Hickory Point Bank, the Newhoff team, now Decatur. We really appreciate it. John, you get the final word. I want to just share with you a Maya Angelou quote, and I want to ask you to think about if it sounds different now than it would have sounded at the beginning of our time together. She said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So I hope, first of all, that that sounds totally different and even neurobiologically sound to you now. And I hope that I've made you feel really inspired by what you bring to the world and the difference that you can make by sharing yourself, by being kind, by giving people great things to mirror, and by being willing to be the one in the conversation that looks for those places that you can connect emotionally. Thank you. Thank you, John. Again, this is the first in the series. So in about three months, be looking again, and you will have a further opportunity again to invest and inspire with uh, Hickory Point Bank. And again, thank you, Carla and the team. We very much appreciate it. And we are getting you out on time today. Have a wonderful Thursday afternoon. And again, we'll see everyone very soon. Thank you, John. You're welcome and thank you too.